Dear colleagues, welcome to today's Council of Cardio-Oncology webinar on amyloidosis and heart failure. I am Dr. Thomas Suder from Bern University Hospital, Switzerland, Vice Chair of the Council of Cardio-Oncology, and I have the pleasure of being together with Dr. Teresa Lopez Fernandez from Hospital Universita de La Plaza, Madrid, Spain, and Dr. Peter van der Meer from University Hospital Groningen, Netherlands. Both are outstanding experts in cardio-oncology and board member of the Council on Cardio-Oncology. Until recently, cardiac amyloidosis was a very, viewed as a very rare disease. However, this changed in the past months and several treatment options and diagnostic options have become available. There are a few things when you should consider cardiac amyloidosis, and these red flags are actually presented on our first uh, slide. First, if you have a patient with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, in particular if this patient is older, consider cardiac amyloidosis. Another one is an elderly patient with aortic stenosis or patients with left ventricular hypertrophy without a history of hypertension, patients with left ventricular hypertrophy with bone lesions, anemia, hypercalcemia, and or renal dysfunction, unexplained neuropathy, or thromboembolic disease. Furthermore, consider cardiac amyloidosis in patients with atrial arrhythmia with low voltage ECG and or pseudo-infarction pattern, and patients who had in the past a carpal tunnel syndrome. Now, let's get started with the first presentation by Teresa Lopez Fernandez. Teresa. Thank you, Thomas. First of all, I want to thank the Council for the opportunity to present today and all of you to attend this webinar. So, uh, my case uh, today is about a 52-year-old woman who was admitted to our hospital in August 2015 because of low fever, diarrhea, edema, abdominal pain, and an unexpected weight loss over the preceding six months. At the emergency room, routine physical showed normal vital signs and a moderate bilateral peripheral edema and a significant abdominal distension. A standard uh, lab tests uh, were unrevealing except for a mild renal dysfunction and a significant increase in anti-pro BNP and also cardiac troponin, really out of proportion with uh, her physical exam. I'm showing you here her ECG. Uh, the ECG show was uh, really low voltages with uh, poorer wave progression in uh, precordial leads. And looking over her previous uh, medical record, we realized that she had a diagnosis of MGAS one year before, and also she has been complaining of difficulty in shallowing due to macrogrossia over the preceding two years. So we decided to perform a baseline echo, and I'm showing you here main images of the study we found a non-dilated left ventricle with a, a severe left ventricular hypertrophy. And uh, we also found an increase in the uh, mitral and tricuspid valve and an increased thickness of the interarterial septum. As you can see here, despite a normal ejection fraction, left ventricular function was abnormal and uh, the EE prime ratio was uh, 20, and also we found a severely decrease in the global longitudinal strain, but uh, the longitudinal function at the apex was preserved. So my question for you is, uh, what could be your next diagnostic step? Because we can't uh, order a cardiac MRI, or uh, you could order more uh, blood tests, uh, could your test aim to rule out a gastrointestinal tumor or other systemic disease or even all of above? So let me quickly jump in here again, Teresa. So the idea here is that this is a highly interactive session and that we 
play with the audience and the audience should answer our questions and uh, we will then provide you with the appropriate answer. This also leads me to quickly announce that at any time during this whole seminar, please feel free to use your chat function and send your questions in for our experts. But let's quickly see and go back to our question. So what would you do next? CM CMR, extensive blood test, rule out GI uh, tumor, rule out systemic disease, or all of the above. And we indeed already have some answers, and I think you will be pleased. So 47% of our audience chose CMR, 40% all of the above. So Teresa, any so, suggestion well, to the yes. audience here? Yes, probably this is a trick question because uh, in general in medicine, we need to try to rule out uh, or to make one clinical diagnosis that may explain all clinical and uh, analytical uh, finding. So in our case, uh, we decided to rule out a systemic disease and we asked for a cardiac MRI in order to characterize myocardial hypertrophy. And also we asked for more uh, blood tests. And I'm showing you here the, the result. We confirm a mild uh, renal dysfunction. We also found uh, hypercholesterolemia and a subclinical hypothyroidism. Can I just quickly interrupt yeah. here? Actually, our audience questions, what's MGUS? So not all are... Monoclonal gamma pathy of unexplained Very origin. Very good. You're yes. almost a hematologist, <laughs> uh, too. Yes. yes. Thank you. So we cleared this. But, but should we see that as a pre-stage for, for the uh, no. multiple myeloma or how do you see that? Well, it's different that multiple myeloma and it's not necessary that MGAS progress to multiple myeloma or yeah. even to the disease that we are talking about that yeah. is, of course, yeah. amyloidosis in, in this webinar. But it it's, could. It could. It, it could, could. Yeah. yeah. The unknown significance probably yes. tells you a lot uh, <laughs> so <laughs> that we don't know, know that much. You no. know when yeah. it's going to progress. Yeah, so. oh, sure. And... Um, other significant uh, laboratory exam was uh, a significant proteinuria uh, in the nephrotic range. And we also asked for a standard serum electrophoresis. The problem is that uh, with this test, we only find a mild monoclonal gamma fraction that is not sensitive enough to rule out a plasma clone. So uh, serum and urine immunofixation and also a free light chain assay were required to confirm in this case uh, a monoclonal lambda band uh, with an abnormal kappa to lambda ratio who were a uh, highly suggestive of untreated uh, light chain amyloidosis. At the same time, we perform a cardiac MRI. Cardiac MRI confirm echo data. And uh, we also found uh, diffuse uh, extensive areas of uh, late gadolinium enhancement, not only uh, through the left ventricle, but also through the right ventricle and through the uh, left atrium that were uh, very specific uh, for um, uh, cardiac amyloidosis, and uh, also using advanced quantification techniques, we found a diffuse uh, rise in native T1 values and extracellular volume. So in this moment, uh, we have a high clinical suspicion of light chain amyloidosis, and uh, we receive at the same time the result uh, of a large bowel biopsy that uh, we did from the beginning of the admission. And uh, this biopsy confirmed Congo red positive amyloid deposits. So um, the definitive diagnosis of light chain amyloidosis with cardiac, hepatic, gastrointestinal, and soft tissue involvement was established, and the patient was referred to the hematology department. Can I ask you again, uh, one sure. of our audience members asked, why not an endomyocardial biopsy at this point? Well, the problem is that in this specific case, uh, when the patient was admitted uh, to our hospital, uh, one of the initial suspicions was a gastrointestinal tumor because a lot of uh, 
uh, abdominal uh, problems and uh, weight loss. Weight loss yeah. So uh, colonoscopy was one of the tests that was right. first before first right. done. And when we received the result of uh, serum and urine immunofixation, we ask for a wrong a Congo red uh, staining uh, from the uh, biopsy that we did yeah. uh, in large bowel. So we have the diagnosis and we didn't need other uh, tissue biopsy to confirm uh, cardiac amyloidosis. Correct. So, so let me ask you another question actually from the audience. That is, would the non-invasive test, so without biopsy, already give you some indication if this is either an AL or rather an ATTR amyloidosis, or can you not differentiate between the two? Well, in general, it's very difficult that uh, transtyretin amyloidosis it has a significant free light chain assay positive. It's not completely impossible, but it's really rare. In fact, some TTR amyloidosis are associated with MGAS. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, if you don't perform the correct serum and urine immunofixation, you can have some uh, problems right. hmm. Good. with the diagnosis. But I think also the endomyocardial biopsy, uh, there are some risks associated with, with, uh, with an invasive procedure. So uh, Sometimes if you, if you only have cardiac involvement, yeah. you need, you need uh, sure. uh, myocardial yeah. biopsy. But, uh, you, we are going to, to review this, but yeah. uh, uh, isolated myocardial involvement is yeah. the exception it, yeah. in late chain amyloidosis. Yeah. So most of the time you can circumvent that and do with non-invasive non or fed biopsies. Fat or biopsy, uh, yes. Yeah, it's yeah. probably the easy one. Yeah. So if, if you would not have led by the symptoms to examine the intestine, what would have been your preference? Let's assume you have a patient who has heart failure, you have all this indication that this could be cardiac amyloidosis, and you need a biopsy, where would you first biopsy this patient? Abdominal fat. Abdominal Definitely. fat. Okay. It's the easier Super. one. So the if easiest. you have yeah. the diagnosis. I probably is most sensitive in this yeah. case. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 Thanks. So we are going to review a little what is uh, late chain amyloidosis and uh, as you know it's a protein misfolding disease that may develop in patients with or without a multiple myoma or may progress from MGAS in around 9% of patients. When the, um, cardiac involvement is uh, present, there is an expansion of the extracellular space by uh, amyloid fibril infiltration. and. Uh, Myocardial dysfunction is due to both uh, tissue infiltration but also a direct toxicity of uh, circulating light chain. As we already said, uh, exclusive cardiac involvement is the exception in this patient. They are generally over 40. And it's very, very important to try to perform an early diagnosis because untreated, the prognosis is really poor in this patient. However, with uh, new hematologic therapies, it is possible to lead uh, to a prolonged disease remission, so we reduce a lot the risk of heart failure and also the risk of sudden death or a uh, significant ventricular yeah. arrhythmias. But the problem is that uh, it's really rare to perform the diagnosis before symptoms occur. In fact, uh, more than one-third of patients need to visit more than five physicians uh, before diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So probably one of the main messages is if you have a patient with an unexplained and heart failure and multi-organ involvement, yeah. try to rule out uh, a cardiac amyloidosis uh, in the, during the, the first uh, stage of, of the diagnosis. Uh, we are going to review some red flags that are very common in patients with uh, cardiac amyloidosis. Uh, in general, the ECG in patients with light chain amyloidosis show uh, low voltages criteria. In fact, uh, this finding is more common in light chain amyloidosis than in uh, TTR uh, amyloidosis. Another common finding in this patient is left ventricular hypertrophy. And uh, in general, patients with late chain amyloidosis have a, a symmetrical pattern of left ventricular hypertrophy, yeah. whereas patients with uh, TTR, it is more common to find asymmetrical septal left ventricular hypertrophy. 
As we have already seen in our clinical case, uh, despite the normal ejection fraction, longitudinal function is uh, severely impaired. And um, uh, when we see not only the uh, global value of uh, longitudinal strain, but also the distribution or the segmental distribution of uh, longitudinal strain, is uh, typical to found in this patient an apical sparring pattern and a radio of EF and an EF GLS radio over four. And with this uh, two finding, we are very sensitive to differentiate uh, cardiac amyloidosis yeah. for a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I find it always very striking to see this apical sparing, like also called like the cherry on top. Uh, is there, is there anything behind that, why we see that? I think there's a lot of discussion about it. There's a lot of discussion about uh, the mechanism of uh, this uh, base to apex uh, yeah. gradient. And uh, we have some information regarding advanced PET and also cardiac MRI yeah. that I'm going to show you in, in a few yeah. slides. But probably is the total amyloid mass which determines this yeah. uh, base to apex gradient yeah. and, of course, Another theory is that uh, at uh, the basal segment, because there are more uh, shear stress of the of the endocardium, um, the, um, the accumulation yeah. of uh, amyloid fibril makes more damage to yeah. to longitudinal right. function yeah. that at the apex. Yeah. But this yeah. theory is not well confirmed. Yeah. So it's but but let me jump in here because this is indeed again an audience question. Uh, the question is actually, how do I differentiate cardiac amyloidosis from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? And you suggest it's the EF uh, over GLS ratio. Is that the only uh, the only differentiation, or no, no, apical sparring pattern. A, a, a severely decrease in global longitudinal strain, but a preserved longitudinal function at the apex probably is, uh, together with this ratio, the most uh, more typical finding in, in these patients. But don't you th also think that the, the discordance between the thick walls you're, gonna, you're seeing and the low voltage on your EKG, that that's... that's yeah, uh, disproportional. Yeah, disproportional it's, low... It's not really yeah. a low voltage yeah. criteria in yeah. all patients, but in no. some patients, the disproportion yeah. that you yeah. are... So I would say that's, that's probably also uh, a very typical finding for amyloidosis. And... Um, ELS correlates well with late gadolinium yeah. enhancement, and in fact, uh, both parameters have a similar base to apex gradient, and uh, this finding is similar across the three main uh, cardiac amyloidosis types. So, uh, do not give us any specific information to distinguish light chain amyloidosis yeah. from TTR yeah. amyloidosis. And uh, that's why uh, we are talking before, probably segmental distribution of total amyloid mass, that yeah. we can measure this total amyloid mass using advanced PET or a cardiac MRI, is what determines the apical sparring uh, pattern. And uh, there's also a close correlation between laying gadolinium enhancement and extravascular, extracellular volume. However, only extracellular volume was closely uh, correlate uh, with the uh, survival of uh, this patient. This is a recently published uh, paper by the group of Dr. Fontana, and uh, they analyze different uh, um, echo and cardiac MRI finding, and they compare when these different parameters, strain, MAPS, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, different parameters, when they, these parameters became abnormal when compared with the total amyloid mass, and even with a low amount of uh, amyloid mass, some parameters like a strain were abnormal. However, in patients with light sign amyloidosis, only this one, TAPS, stroke volume, and index left atrial area were related with uh, mortality. And uh, this is a new tool that uh, we have, an advanced PET with uh, Florbetapir. It's difficult to pronounce it. <laughs> we, we learn Sounds a lot like of an animal, but yes, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> we learn a lot of vocabulary yeah. in cardio oncology yeah, yeah. every day. But uh, uh, this uh, tracer is really sensitive 
for early recognition of systemic involvement in these patients. And uh, I'm showing you here uh, a clinical case, it's not from my hospital, uh, of course, but uh, you can see in a patient with untreated light chain amyloidosis an intense myocardial uptake prior to chemo. And three months after a complete remission was achieved, there is only a low grade uptake. So it could be a useful tool to monitor the follow-up of uh, this uh, patient. Is it widely available, that, uh, that tracer, or...? Um, not. No. Uh, at least in my hospital, we didn't no. have it. Uh, no. In in Spain, there are several centers who have the possibility to, to use this tool, but it's, yeah. I so think it's that really is it's a little bit beyond the research, but yes. not really mainstream. We have data uh, from the past two, three years, yeah. so it's yeah. not wide no. or available. No. Can I go one step back because one of our audience is asking, so in case you would not have found amyloid in your biopsy from the gout, what would you have done next? So specifically, the, the, uh, the, the member of the audience asked if abdominal fat and salivary gland biopsy, this is actually something else which we should mention as an option, if both would have been negative for amyloidosis, what would you have done in your patient? Well, a bone marrow biopsy is also an is also an option yeah. if you have a monoclonal uh, band and uh, you need to confirm the diagnosis. A bone marrow biopsy is also an uh, a great option, but uh, of course you need to contact with the hematology department yeah. in order to to consider other options. And then probably uh, eventually a cardiac biopsy. And a cardiac biopsy, sure. yeah. yes. So from the treatment point of view, as you know, um, light chain amyloidosis treatment is twofold. We need to treat heart failure and we need to treat plasma cell dyscrasia. Yeah. Regarding heart failure, diuretics are the main stain of treatment because uh, sometimes ACE inhibitors or beta blockers are poorly tolerated because of hypotension yeah. in, in these patients. We need to avoid inotrop negative agent. Uh, digosin uh, is contraindicate or at least it's not yeah. the first choice because of a high risk of uh, toxicity. Yeah. And uh, this also recommended early anticoagulation if arterial arrhythmias occur. We need also to monitor conduction disturbances and in selected cases we can consider heart transplant if the main hematologic disease was uh, resolved. In our patient, um, well, the first stage from the hematologic treatment was to determine the uh, eligibility for autologous uh, hematopoietic third transplant. In this case, the patient was considered fit for transplant, so a seaboard dex uh, therapy was uh, started, followed by mefalan and autologous third transplant, and the patient achieved a complete remission. And uh, three years later, this is uh, her echo with uh, markedly improvement yeah. in the longitudinal function. And uh, even the apical sparring pattern was disappeared. And uh, because our first biopsy was made uh, through a colonoscopy, we repeat uh, the procedure and there are no amyloid deposits and uh, large bowel uh, biopsy. And the patient is, uh, is doing well. So my conclusion, we need to increase clinical suspicion in patients with unexplained heart failure. Of course, we need to confirm the diagnosis by biopsy, but we have different non-invasive modalities that could increase our clinical suspicion. And uh, this uh, slide summarizes the main red flags in uh, light chain amyloidosis. Of course, is really, really important to increase our collaboration with hematology department and through the cardio-oncology unit in order to improve heart failure treatment in this patient during the hematologic treatment. Well, thank you, Teresa. Excellent. Just want to ask you quickly, except the hemato-oncology treatment, did you add any other treatments such as uh, doxycycline or green tea, for example, is, is, a, is a frequent flyer in these patients? Well, it's difficult to answer this question. I didn't recommend other treatments, sorry. So no, no other no. Uh, treatment. Okay, very good. Thank you again. Uh, Thank excellent. You. This brought you up to a, a great start, a great uh, topic. I think you covered all.
of AL amyloidosis. Peter, you're next. Uh, before we start with you, however, I should say that this session is supported by Allianz uh, Pharmaceutical. We thank you very much because they made uh, this session uh, possible. Again, to the audience, please interact with us. We're more than happy to answer your questions. There are a lot of questions coming in. Not sure if we can answer all, but uh, this is now the time to discuss another form of amyloid and yes. a form which we think is rapidly increasing, yeah. for, for example, yeah. because we never expected it to be there. More awareness, I think, and perhaps yeah. some treatment option. I would like to show you some, uh, some slides. Thank you, uh, Thomas and Teresa. So I would also like to start with, uh, with the case. Uh, it's a 74-year-old male patient with a medical history of hypertension and depression, and he was treated for both with metaprolol, 50 milligrams once daily, and paroxetine, 20 milligrams once daily. And this 74-year-old male was walking with friends, and all of a sudden he experienced sudden, su uh, shortness of breath. He denies chest pain and palpitations, and normally he can bike 70 to 80 kilometers without any problems. And the ambulance brings the patient to our ER. When we see this male, he is slightly obese with a BMI of 31, uh, blood pressure 150, 82, heart rate relatively slow, I would say, with 55 beats per minute, no murmurs, and there was crepitus on both basal lung fields. And on the extremities, we saw a trace of peripheral edema, and the pulses and neuro, they were intact. If we look at the lab values, hemoglobin was low normal, 13 grams per deciliter. Renal function was somewhat impaired with an EG estimated uh, GFR of 48 milliliters per minute. Sodium was normal, potassium was normal, but anti-pro-BMP clearly elevated above 2,000, nano, above 2000 nanograms per liter. And high sensitive troponin was also elevated, 38, whereas the normal range is below 14. His uh, thyroid function was normal with a TSH of 2.1. This is his EKG. It shows sinus rhythm, 65 beats per minute. And as you can see, there's a first degree AV block. The QRS is somewhat broadened with 131 milliseconds. And the axis is rightward. And as you can appreciate, there's a QS pattern on the right precordial leads and there is slow uh, uh, R-wave progression. We made an X-X-ray. Uh, as you can see here, uh, enlarged heart uh, and redistribution of the, of the fluid, even some, if you look very closely, some curly B lines. Then as a logical next step, uh, with this patient coming in with a suspicion of acute heart failure, we made a transthoracic echocardiogram. This is the parasternal long axis um, with the LV here, uh, the aorta, aortic valve, the mitral valve, and as you can appreciate, clearly thickened septal and posterior wall. And even here, if you would very closely, with the RV uh, is, is certainly uh, uh, thickened. In fact, the, the pattern of left ventricular hypertrophy was asymmetrical yeah. because the septum is uh, right. thicker yeah. than, the, than the posterior yeah. wall. Yeah. And also it's easy to find this uh, um, increase in the speckle of the muscle that sometimes appear in patients with, uh, yeah. uh, with this yeah. disease. Yeah, with amyloidosis. <laughs> with amyloidosis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, sure. Uh, so it's a really I typical I fully agree. So, so here image. you see some asymmetrical uh, uh, hypertrophy. Uh, this is the four-chamber view, uh, the RV, LV, left atrium, right atrium, and also here the RV, it's not that clearly, you can't see it that clearly here, but the RV is, is, uh, uh, is the, uh, thickened. This is the TVI measurements uh, of the uh, septal, uh, septal wall, uh, indication for elevated filling pressures, E over E prime, 19.8 clearly elevated, should be below 8. 
um, and low uh, tissue velocities, uh, E prime lateral 4.6, E prime septal 3.5, so very, very, very low. Very low. So, this, um, so to summarize the uh, echocardiography findings, so hypertro hypertrophic uh, LV, uh, septal wall 29, posterior wall 25, so, so some asymmetry, not, not that clear, I would say. Uh, the posterior wall is also clearly uh, thickened. Ejection fraction preserved, 57%. Severely impaired diastolic LV function. Hypertrophic RV, the RV wall, uh, free wall measured 10 millimeters. And we did not see any significant valvular abnormalities. And particularly no uh, SAM, no systolic, uh, systolic anterior movement of the mitral valve. And we saw an enlarged left and right atrium. So the question to the audience uh, uh, would be, what would be now the most appropriate next diagnostic step? Would it be A, a cardiac CT to, uh, 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 to image the coronary arteries? Would it be a coronary angiography? C, bone marrow scintigraphy, a transesophageal echo, genetic testing, or would you send the patient to the EP lab? So, Peter, thank you so much. Uh, we give the audience uh, five more seconds to decide what they want. Uh, I think you will be pleased with the answer. So, 53% of our audience chose a bone scintigraphy. Oh, would great. you agree with that? Yes, I think I would, would agree with that. I can also uh, live with a coronary angiogram, although the echo is, is so... So, it, the question was, of course, aimed at what would be your diagnostic step where you would be most likely to, to, to give you the diagnosis, whereas I think you can defend a coronary angiogram in, in a 76-year-old patient It seems that symptoms are quite acute. Quite no? acute, yeah. yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, it's not uh, typical from, no. for these patients. Well, you know, if you ask, so that was the, the anamnesis in the, uh, in the ER, so normally he could bike 70 to 80 kilometers. Well, that was an electronic bike, so an e-bike. So, you know, I want to mention it. In, in, in Holland, it's flat, in, in, so yeah. uh, it's so, probably not representative. In Switzerland, <laughs> they would definitely have symptoms. Uh, so, but I agree. But if you would go a little bit more in that, there was already definitely decrease in his in his performance. Okay. So, can I just quickly ask you something? The upper runner in the answer of the audience is actually cardiac CT. What would be the role of cardiac CT? in cardiac amyloidosis? Uh, very limited, I would say. So, but in, in this case, if you, if you would review it more from a 74-year-old uh, male coming right. in with acute heart failure, um, although cardiac function, the, the, the systolic function was preserved, um, you could have a di differential diagnosis of, of, uh, of, of uh, coronary artery disease. But then I would say, then your su suspicion would be relatively high. So if you would go for the imaging of the coronaries, I would say this is not really to rule out coronary artery disease. So, if if that would be the the goal of your test to rule out to 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 look for coronary artery disease, I think this patient would qualify for a coronary angiogram. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, probably because of a risk factor, previous risk yeah. factor, the risk of having a calcium at the coronary artery yeah. that uh, could not give you the right diagnosis during CT. Yeah, yeah. No? So, so relatively, but at least if you if you have normal ejection say. fraction without uh, segmental uh, yeah. contracted problems. Yeah. It's also a good yeah. tool, no it's, cardiac CT. Yeah, of course. But in a seventy-four-year-old male with no, hypertension, limit. you know, it's yeah. So, um, so we did some uh, the, the bone scintigraphy, as you can see here, the the uh, technetium uh, scan. It's a, a phosphate tracer which binds to to the bone, uh, but also to the uh, to the heart, and that's very abnormal. So a bone uh, scintigraphy here, you can see the visual grading score. Normally, this would be how a bone scintigram uh, looks. Definitely no uptake in the heart. Very mild uptake at grade one, but here at grade two and grade three, you see clearly uptake of the tracer in the heart, and that's absolutely abnormal. So this patient would would be a uh, grading score between two and three, I would say. Can, can I, uh, Teresa? Can I ask you if you would have done the same exam in your patient? What would you have expected to see? Probably grade zero or one. One. 
Yeah. Because in some patients with late chain amyloidosis, it's possible to have a mild uptake in the, this bone scintigraphy. Yeah. But, but certainly not never, two or three. Never, never two or three. No, no. no. Then that, if, you, if you get a two or three and you have the suspicion of AL amyloidosis, then you really have to look further. Yeah. Then, uh, For sure. So we did some more uh, workup. We did the coronary angiogram, <laughs> you know, uh, we're cardiologists. Um, uh, we performed also an MRI, uh, the cardiac MRI, with extensive areas of delayed gadolinium enhancement, um, severe left ventricular hypertrophy, and severe right ventricular hypertrophy. We did a fat biopsy, as also suggested in the, uh, in the previous case, and we saw Congo red positive staining. And then the next step would, would be to exclude a genetic form of the uh, TTR. So we did a whole uh, exome uh, uh, sequencing, and we did not find any mutations there. Do you think that with this result it's necessary to exclude a monoclonal band well, with lab what, tests? Yeah, uh, or it's not necessary in this, in this patient? Well, it's, it's a kind of a... Uh, what, what would you do? Would you? Are you no. doing it in your... Uh, Probably it's not necessary, but if you review guidelines, yeah. or if you review the algorithm or yeah. in most diagnosis paper, in, in uh, they decide to rule out yeah. a, a monoclonal yeah. band. Yeah. To we, we, in, in this case, we did not do it because yeah. everything was, direct, was so clear. It. Um, but it's, it's a good discussion. You, 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 you could, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I think one of the problems with the MGOS really in the elderly population is it's frequently false yeah. positive. That means in terms of amyloidosis. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's literature to suggest that up to six, uh, 60 years old patients may up to 20%, 25% may have actually an MGOS. So then you have to, to keep on going. Uh, you have to do the light change, uh, the ratio, and so on yeah. to be sure sure that you really don't have a plasma cell dyscrasia, which uh, is, the, is the problem yeah. of what we're yeah. seeing here. But with this clear bone scintigraphy. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's a yeah. different... Uh, Although I have to say, we have two patients in our cohort that, uh, who have both AL yeah. as well as ATTR. We have yeah. two. Is, it, is yeah. it possible and treatment is different? Yeah. yeah the Absolutely. Treatment, yeah. 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 So of course, because uh, like when, when, we, when you look at all the, 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 the literature, so patients uh, going for aortic valve replacement, numbers of 13% have been uh, given. Uh, perhaps it's a little bit lower in the in general. If you look at the heart failure population, perhaps 6 to 8%. But of course, I think it's not that un unlikely that you would have both diseases. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, to diagnose, so we diagnose this male with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction based on a wild type ATTR uh, amyloidosis. So I think when we when you look more from from a heart failure pers uh, perspective, diagnosing heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, it, it, it's not a diagnosis. You you really have to look for the etiology. In the same way, we're looking for the etiology if you talk about heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. So yes, genetic testing might be needed for the ATTR or the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, I think this is a very, very outspoken case, but many of these cases, there is some, se some septal wall thickening, whereas the posterior wall is less. So it, it's, I think, clear, clearly differential diagnosis. The, the proteinuria uh, with, for the AL amyloidosis, of course, sure. the bone scintigraphy to uh, diagnose the wild type, but also the genetic form of the transteratin amyloidosis. Uh, and as you can see here, the, the diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is, is, is a broad one, uh, not even, also not to talk about hemochromatosis. I think Chaga is very uh, regional if you, if you need to think about it, uh, yes or no. So if we talk about the pathobiology of transteratin amyloidosis, uh, transteratin is uh, produced in the liver, so the TTR MR, uh, mRNA, uh, then forms tetramers, uh, and the problem occurs when these monomers are appearing, and these monomers uh, are, uh, can be misfolded, and these misfolded monomers uh, can give the aggregates, uh, which uh, uh, may deposit in, in the heart, or in the, uh, in the peripheral uh, or in an autonomic nervous system. Same what you were discussing with low blood pressure, sometimes low heart rate, etc. Mm -hmm. This is a great, a great review uh, published uh, recently in, uh, in Jack, a state-of-the-art review by uh, uh, Matthew Maurer, his, uh, his, uh, his group. And uh, they came up with this uh, uh, diagram, this algorithm, how to, uh, how to continue with the patient with a suspicion of, uh, uh, of amyloidosis. And I think 
a few factors, and, and, and I think we all fully agree with that, if there is a heightened uh, index of suspicion, and I summarize them here a little bit bigger, the discordance between e ECG and the left ventricular hypertrophy. So low voltage on your, on your ECG, but uh, thick walls. And I think that's, that would definitely raise your uh, suspicion. And I think also what you said, Thomas, in the introduction, carpal tunnel is, is such a, a, a red flag positive troponin T, and no uh, acute coronary syndrome, among others, of course. And then here in this, uh, exactly what you were saying, like in your, in your diagram, uh, in your algorithm, assess for the presence of monoclonal protein. So yes, I think it is, you, you could do it. It depends also how much, how, how easily can you do bone scintigraphy. For example, in, in our center, it's, it's at hand. We can do it every day in the week. You order it, and in, in, a, in a few days, you have the results there. Um, so, so the question is, uh, yeah, uh, do we really need to do the monoclonal protein if you have a very clear case? But um, I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's a sens Probably sensible it, kind of approach. It depends also of the, of the symptoms of the patient, because if you have several organ involvement that are yeah. not really related yeah. with uh, transterity and amyloidosis, yeah. not only neuropathy, yeah. but uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, bowel yeah. Yeah. involvement or... Yeah. Um, I agree. And b but it is very important because the treatment, and that will be in, in the next slide, uh, I will show some, are completely different. So, so you have to be sure you're not dealing with an AL amyloidosis, of course. Then if the bone scintigraphy is available, in most of the centers I would say that would be yes. Uh, then uh, the invasive, uh, non-invasive e evaluation with the bone uh, scintigraphy if it's the bone scintigraphy is negative, the cardiac amyloidosis is very unlikely. If it's uh, positive, there's a very high sensitivity and specificity of the bone scintigraphy, uh, and the, the, the scan is positive, then the last step would be to exclude a genetic form. Perhaps not necessarily for the patient, but uh, uh, for, for certain for his, uh, his family members. So just to answer again a question from all our sure. audience. So if your bone uh, scintigraphy is positive, you're not going to go for a biopsy anymore. That's it. Uh, in our center, we do, uh, but um, um, I can, I, this, this uh, algorithm, I think, is, is very, uh, th this, there is such a high sensitivity and specificity. For the fat biopsy, the uh, uh, sensitivity and specificity is lower than for the bone scintigraphy. So if you would have a bone scintigraphy, you're somewhat in doubt, I think I, I, would, I would certainly go for a fat biopsy. And on, on a routine basis, we're doing it, but we're also doing it in a research-wise to, to better learn about sensitivity, specificity, uh, how should we perform the, the fat biopsy. Um, but the, the, the bone scintigraphy has a very high sensitivity and specificity. So I think, of course, it's always nice to, to have the right diagnosis with your patient, but it becomes even more interesting to, uh, 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 to, to see whether you can indeed treat the disease. Uh, and for a uh, long time, the only treatment would have been, uh, especially for the, for the hereditary one, would be to have a liver transplant. Uh, but with the shortage of organ donors, that's, that's now almost obsolete. Um, and there are, as you can see here, uh, several options how and some of them are potential options, uh, which have not yet been uh, studied in uh, uh, cardiac amyloido amyloidosis, like the majority. Many of these trials are in phase one or in phase two. So uh, you could block the production of the TTR uh, with, with uh, SI RNA, so small interfering RNA-based uh, um, uh, therapy or antisense treatment. It could be to stabilize the, uh, the, uh, the disease. Uh, to st stabilize the, the tetramere so it does not fall apart in monomeres which are so toxic for the, for the heart and would lead to these aggregates. Uh, one of these options, and I will show you the phase 3 trial which recently has been uh, published with Tafamidis, uh, and then uh, really phase 1 uh, where it would be an option, are there uh, some antibodies which would bind to these fibrils and then would lead to removal of these, uh, these fibrils and indeed cure the disease. So very uh, exciting area where there's a lot of research is, is going on. But can I just quickly sure. ask you a question to this slide? So patisiron is actually one of these novel uh, treatments. Yeah. Would this be an option for the wild type cardiac amyloidosis yeah. too? Yeah, it would. It, it would. would. Yeah, so it does not bind specifically to the, to the mutated part. 
So it would be an option also for the uh, uh, for the for the for the wild type form. Although we should, but it's I think we should be very cautious. It's, it's not, not approved for that, Absolutely. and there have not there are no published trials on that. So the trials for these RNA -B based uh, therapies they are really uh, 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 focused on the neuropathy. Absolutely. Yeah. Most most of these patients had the mutated TTR with neuropathy. Uh, but, and I will show in the last slides something about uh, if you look at these patients, the cardiac involvement, you see some uh, promising effects, I think. So the only phase three trial we have so far is the ATTRACT study, uh, which studied tafamidis. Uh, so patients uh, were screened, they were randomized to a low and higher dose of tafamidis or placebo, and then they were uh, followed up. The key inclusion criteria was the presence of amyloid deposit in a, a biopsy tissue that could also be, it could be cardiac, but in the majority of the case also non-cardiac fat biopsy, um, and the identification of the uh, precursor protein. There sh must be cardiac involvement. This is really a cardiomyopathy uh, trial um, in contrast to the other trials which have been done in amyloidosis so far. Septal wall thickness uh, should be above 12 millimeters. A history of heart failure with hospitalization uh, are symptoms of congestive heart failure and patients were using diuretics. Anti-pro BMP elevated, six-minute walk. So because it's, it goes very often hand-in-hand -hand with neuropathy uh, uh, problems, so there should, the patient should be at least be able to walk 100 meters in six minutes. Key exclusion criteria, and it's important to keep in mind that it, if you would be class four, functional class four, you could not participate in the trial and a severely impaired uh, renal function. The efficacy outcomes was the uh, uh, hierarchical combination of all-cause mortality and frequency of cardiovascular-related hospitalizations, and there was a key secondary endpoint, six-minute walk test, and the uh, quality of life summary score. Average age, 74 years old, vast majority were male, as we know, the, the 90% of the patients with ATTR are male, uh, male patients. Uh, in this trial, uh, one quarter was the uh, patient with the genetic form, three quarters had the wild type, uh, the rest speaks for itself. Ejection fraction was largely preserved, um, although there were patients with a reduced ejection fraction. Wall thickness, um, septal wall thickness around uh, 17 millimeters, uh, same for the posterior wall, and anti-pro BMP clearly elevated around 3,000, and troponin slightly elevated, I would say here. So the primary analysis showed yeah, staggering results with 70% with, uh, patients alive at two and a half years in the treated group versus 57% at the, at the placebo-treated uh, group. And here you can see in a Kaplan-Meier curve, and um, that's very interesting that the, uh, the, the curves are only separating after uh, 18 months. Uh, so here after 18 months you see a clear separation of the curves where the tafamidus group is doing better than the placebo group. And always interesting to look at subgroups, which are there subgroups who do particularly benefit from the treatment or subgroups who do not benefit from the treatment. So overall, the, if the patient had genetic form or the wild type, it did not matter. The effects were, uh, were similar in both groups, but there was a clear difference. If patients would, would, were in functional class three, so more severe symptoms, the treatment benefit was, uh, uh, was almost absent, or at least not significant. And it could have related, also if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves, that these curves are, are separating only after uh, 18 months, and perhaps the patients who are in class three do not have the time to, uh, to really see the yeah. effect of the treatment. Uh, and there was no difference between uh, the low or the high dose of uh, the treatment used. Here, key, very important secondary endpoint, six-minute walk, there was a steep decline in six-minute walk uh, test in the placebo group. There was a decline, but it was uh, uh, was less pronounced compared to the placebo from the uh, group mm -hmm. from the beginning. So on, on symptoms, you see more clear effects also from the beginning, whereas the effects on outcome are, are more uh, clear uh, after 18 months. So interesting, interesting findings, but also quite some question yeah. marks, I would say. Uh, quality of life shows a similar pattern compared to the six-minute walk test. This is the other trial which you also brought up, uh, Thomas, uh, which was one of the RNA interference therapies, uh, so the uh, SIRNA-based uh, uh, treatment where the 
uh, carrier binds to the RNA and where it's being degraded, so it's not being translated, so the protein is not being made. And this is a sub-study. Uh, typically, only patients with hereditary TT, uh, TTR could participate. It was a neuropathy trial again, uh, and it was a sub-study on the cardiac effects. And the researchers, it was published by Scott Solomon in circulation this year, were interested to look at the cardiac effects. So how, what's the percentage of patients who would show a reduction in uh, left ventricular uh, uh, wall thickness? And it would be, uh, should be at least uh, more than two millimeters if, uh, if you would consider it as a decrease, also taking the noise in consideration. And you can see that the patients who were treated uh, with, uh, with active drug uh, showed uh, around one quarter to one third of reduction in uh, LV uh, wall thickness, whereas this uh, uh, barely happened in the patient treated, uh, treated with placebo. And the same was also true, true for the global longitudinal stra strain, which decreased in, uh, um, uh, in the patients who were treated compared to the patients treated with, uh, with the placebo. So uh, I think interesting subgroup analysis, which gives you an idea that it might also uh, uh, be beneficial in, in cardiac function. But yeah, real phase three data do not uh, exist for the cardiac amyloidosis. So I think to conclude this part about the ATTR amyloidosis, uh, if you diagnose heart failure with the preserved ejection fraction, look, search for the etiology. In this case, it was an ATTR. The echocardiogram was quite suggestive, I would say. Many, many cases it would be less pronounced. And uh, also look in, in, in these cases for the ATTR because it might be prevalent in, in, in around, some say around 13%, especially in the older uh, population. Uh, it might, the, the answer might be somewhat in between. In, in general, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy is always higher in patients with TTR amyloidosis yeah. than the patient with late yeah. chain amyloidosis. Yeah. So it's really a, yeah. a very, very typical finding. Yeah, yeah, fully agree. Uh, bone scintigraphy has a very high sensitivity and specificity for the uh, ATTR. Uh, AL, uh, I think you showed a very, very nice case about AL, uh, needs completely different treatment, but, but with spectacular outcomes if in, 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 the, in the recent years. Uh, so to, if you miss that and you would uh, start treatment for, for ATTR where you did not confirm the ATTR, I think that that's, uh, would be very bad, uh, bad practice. Uh, genetic testing is needed to exclude uh, the hereditary form. Uh, uh, I think very important for family members of the patient. Treatment itself would not be uh, that different. Uh, and I think if you would overall look at this, uh, this concept, if we think about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, I think these are really the first steps if you talk about personalized medicine. So you've, you find a specific etiology and you treat that in a very specific way, if either stabilizing the, uh, the tetramers like the family is doing, or uh, you... Um, uh, you reduce the, the production of the protein by RNA-based uh, RNA uh, technologies. And perhaps in the future, trials are, uh, are on their way whether you can either remove the, the amyloid deposits in the heart if you would have antibody-based uh, 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 approaches. But yeah, these are really phase one. There are some, uh, some, uh, uh, some other ways, but we need to see what the results are. Excellent, Peter. I think this is a very good, very comprehensive overview over ATTR amyloidosis. And actually, can't resist to ask you a question from the Netherlands. Ah. Uh, any data on <laughs> ethnic <Dutch>. difference, <laughs> African versus non-Africans, in amyloidosis in Europe? I think if you look at the, uh, the genetic forum, and it was a publication several years uh, ago, the VELMET 30 uh, mutations, very, very prevalent, uh, more common in, in Afro-Americans. So yes, there might be, and there are also hotspots in the, in the world, typically for the genetic form of, of TTR. If there is a, if, if a second question would perhaps be, is there also such a genetic form for the, for the, for the, for the wild type? Um, well, not, not really the Mendel Mendelian kind of uh, genetics we're, we're talking about, a uh, dominant uh, uh, um, uh, 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 hereditary mm. form. Uh, but, but you could easily think, why would only in certain patients lead this wild-type transteratin to the disease? What are the factors associated with it? Is it oxidative stress? Is it what kind of factors? And it might be that there are some genetic 
predisposition to get the disease, but we, we do not know at this Absolutely. case. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so Teresa, there's a question for you because you mentioned low voltage ECG, and this seemed not to be clear to the audience. Can you tell me again what you consider a low voltage ECG? Well, there are classical criteria uh, you see an uh, ECG, but uh, Probably the, the main uh, red flag in this patient is not classical criteria, but the disproportion that we talk about between the uh, uh, left ventricular wall thickness and uh, the voltage. So it's not exactly how many millimeters the QRS uh, uh, yeah. wide, but uh, the, the disproportion when you look at the uh, left ventricular wall thickness. And in fact, in TTR myridosis is less frequent, and yeah. the ECG that yeah. uh, you show yeah. was, was definitely normal. not low voltage. Yeah, so R relatively low voltage, perhaps if you would think about the wall thickness of 25 millimeters, uh, you would ex expect you would expect more an hyper a hypertrophic yeah. cardiomyopathy. But it was not so clear as in your case, where you really had the it's more typical voltage. in light chain amyloidosis, very, very yeah, low, very one, good. two millimeters. There's another question for you, actually, really? that comes from the UK. What uh, clinical specialities should be in a multidisciplinary team? You mentioned a multidisciplinary team that should take care of the AL uh, amyloidosis patients. So who should be in this team? Well, in, in our case, our cardio-oncology team, uh, we, we are cardiologists, hematologists, oncologists, but also family doctors and uh, uh, people from the uh, analysis uh, laboratory at, at the hospital and also nurses are very important as a member of uh, cardio-oncology units. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So, Peter, uh, we have a lot of questions. I think they're very important question in patients with renal failure. So, number one, how is renal failure affecting the diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis? And number two, is there any evidence that treatment should be different in the patients with, uh, with renal problems, and particularly also with, with dialysis? Good, good question. So, if, uh, if, uh, well, if we would go back to the, uh, to the, to the presentation, uh, let me see if um, there are some... Um, so the exclusion criteria for the uh, treatment of, the, uh, if we talk about tafamidis, uh, would be ejection, uh, EGFR uh, below 25. So we do not know the safety of this drug in patients with, with, with poor, uh, poor renal function, with CKD class 4 or 5. If we talk about other potential options, uh, diflunicel is an NSAID uh, drug has been some, some, some smaller studies have been done with this, uh, this drug, very cheap drug, um, but it's a non-steroid anti-inflammatory drug. So uh, renal function, uh, uh, electrolyte abnormality should, should be really well taken care of if you would consider, uh, uh, for example, uh, this drug. Uh, for, for the treatment. The tafamidis, uh, if we look at the safety profile, is, is relatively comparable to the, to the placebo in this also very sick population. So yes, if you talk about dialysis patients, we do not have, have any data. So uh, it would, if, if we think about the label of the drug, I can imagine that EGFR of 25 would be taken as an exclusion criteria to um, not to prescribe it or be very cautious about that. Would renal failure affect the MRI diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis? Well, you're the specialist on that, but... Well, the problem is that in patients with a perhaps, severe yeah. um, renal dysfunction, in general, we avoid to administrate gadolinium, but yeah. uh, uh, we have a lot of information with native uh, T1 yeah, T, mapping, yeah. and we okay. didn't need gadolinium. Excellent. I think we are now approaching the end of our uh, webinar, and I want to thank you two again for doing an excellent job, Teresa, Peter, uh, very comprehensive. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I would like to close by summarizing the session. Uh, cardiac amyloidosis is certainly underdiagnosed. Uh, there are for cardiac view uh, three important types, the wild type, uh, ATTR amyloidosis AL, and then obviously also the hereditary the M ATTR amyloidosis. In the wild type ATTR amyloidosis, consider the red flags, which we discussed. 
HEFPEF, aortic stenosis, LVH, without any reason you can explain the LVH with. Uh, one of the state of the art in diagnosis now is certainly uh, nuclear scans. Then in AL, amyloidosis again, the red flags. Here again, the ECG, it's probably more sensitive than in ATTR. Amyloidosis, consider that uh, patients with multiple myeloma have a high incidence of cardiac AL amyloidosis, probably around 10%. So keep that in mind and, and monitor these patients for cardiac my, uh, amyloidosis. And finally, it is important and it's crucial for these patients to have an early diagnosis for best efficacy, not only for the normal therapeutics, but for all the therapeutics that are available at this point. Anything to add to this? No, it's a very nice summary, Thomas. <laughs> okay, so that uh, again concludes this session. I want to thank the audience, excellent uh, participations. We got a lot of uh, questions. I apologize that we couldn't answer all of that. I want to again uh, thank Aliran uh, Pharmaceuticals for supporting us. And I want to motivate you to join the Council of Cardio Oncology, a new, very active group. Uh, there's free membership. You don't have to be a member of ESC. Join us and participate in the discussion. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Okay. Awesome.